Thank you. If you look out at the night sky, you'll see a lot of stars. Well, at least once in a while when it's not raining in Vancouver. But if you look through a powerful telescope, like the Hubble Space Telescope, you'll see distant galaxies from the furthest parts of the universe. Now look around you in this room. What do you see? You see me standing over here. You see lots of people around you. You see chairs. You see cell phones, computers, these nice plants. You see a lot of stuff in this room, too. There are two very interesting facts about these observations. One, everything that you see out there in space and everything that you see here in this room is made of the same stuff, the same stuff. Two, even more interesting than that, is the fact that the universe, for the most part, is not made of this stuff. The universe is made of something totally different. So what is the universe made of? A small fraction of the universe is made of something we know. A much larger fraction of the universe is made of something we don't know. <laughs> so the stuff that we know, we call visible matter. It's something we can see, we can experience, we're all familiar with. The stuff that we don't know, we call dark matter. It's invisible, we cannot see it, but we know it's there. And as you can see, it forms the bulk of the matter in the universe. Now, obviously, visible matter is very important. It makes up everything around us, all our gadgets and even ourselves. But in a way, dark matter is even more important than that. If it wasn't for dark matter, structure would not have formed in the universe. Galaxies would not have formed the way they did. And that would be a bit of a problem for us because we live in one such galaxy. So dark matter is very important. It's also more important than visible matter. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. But before talking about the unknown, Let's talk about the known, and I'll tell you a little bit about visible matter first. So the idea that matter is made of fundamental building blocks goes back to the ancients. It was ancient Greek philosophers who came up with the idea of the atom, an indivisible object which made up everything else. Well, we've come a long way from then. We know for a fact now that the atom itself is made up of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Different atoms have different numbers of these, but all atoms are made of these. However, in the last 50 years or so, we've discovered that the proton and neutron themselves are not indivisible, but are made of even smaller objects called quarks. So today, all matter is made up of quarks and leptons. The electron is a lepton and a few other particles. And we have a fundamental description of matter in terms of these elementary particles. In addition to that, we can also describe the way nature works in terms of these elementary particles. So that's pretty cool. The discovery of these elementary particles has changed the way we live. It's changed our lives. Now think about it. If it wasn't for the electron, we would probably not have the electronics industry today. The proton was discovered around 100 years back, but today it's found its application in medicine. In fact, certain kinds of cancers, like eye cancers, are treated using proton therapy, and that's also done right here in Vancouver. The only reason we can do that is because we understand the proton well enough. In addition to these, Technology has also improved and developed to keep up with the discovery of these particles. The World Wide Web that we all know and love was discovered at CERN, which is a particle physics lab, because there was a need to, dis to transfer information very quickly to researchers all over the world. And we obviously know the world would be a very different place today without the internet. So that being said, the real reason we do particle physics is not so much for the practical applications. The real reason we do particle physics is because of the intellectual challenge. We want to understand how the universe works. We want to understand what it's made of. We want to understand our place in the universe. We want to, ask, we want to ask the big questions and try and answer them. So in that same spirit of inquiry, let's step into the invisible world. Here's a picture of a galaxy. A galaxy is made of hot gas and stars, and they rotate under the gravitational force. As you can see, it's very bright in the center, indicating that most of the luminous matter is in the center, and it's dim on the edges. As you can imagine, parts of the galaxy towards the center are moving a lot faster than the galaxy at the edge. So the stars towards the center are rotating a lot faster than the stars at the edge of the galaxy. This is what you would expect, and this is what astronomers thought as well, until they actually looked at it through a telescope. What they noticed was the edges of the galaxy were rotating a, fa a lot faster than they were expected to, which is the line shown as B in the plot. The edges of the galaxy were rotating a lot faster than one expected, indicating there was some other matter out there, invisible matter, matter that was not luminous, which was causing the galaxy to rot rotate faster than you'd expect. This was the very first evidence that there was for dark matter. 
And the first time people discovered this was in the 1930s. So dark matter plays a role in galaxies. Dark matter also plays a role in clusters of galaxies, bigger groups of galaxies. Here is an image of the bullet cluster, which is two groups of galaxies which have collided together. The pink is the hot gas and stars, the visible matter. The blue is the dark matter. Obviously, when you look at it in the sky, you don't see pink and blue. It's here for illustration. So imagine you have two groups of galaxies, two big blobs, one blob here of pink and blue, one blob here of pink and blue, and they're colliding. This image is shown after the collision, but this is what happens. So you have these two blobs, and they collide. So the pink in this blob and the pink in this blob hits each other. There's interactions, there's collisions, friction, and as the hot gas passes by, it slows down. The blue in the two blobs doesn't interact with anything, so it just goes by very smoothly. As a result of this collision, the pink stuff that passes by slows down, but the blue stuff doesn't. And that's exactly what you see in this picture. The blue has overtaken the pink and gone further off. So this is what you would expect if you had this invisible dark matter in the, in the group of galaxies, and this is exactly what astronomers saw. So this is very striking, striking evidence for there to be dark matter in even groups of galaxies. Now, all that is great. There's some dark matter out there in the universe somewhere, in galaxies or cluster of galaxies. What's the situation like for us on, in our galaxy? What is it like for us in our corner of the universe? We live in the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It has a big bulge in the center and a flat disk-like structure. It's a pretty big galaxy, and the point-marked sun on the image is our solar system. It's just a speck in this image. Now, if you left the Milky Way, you turned around and you looked back at it, this is what you would see. You would see this nice galaxy, which is rotating. However, the truth is that the Milky Way itself is surrounded by a big halo of dark matter. In fact, most of the matter in the Milky Way is not visible matter, but it's dark matter. More than 90% of it is dark matter. So we live in a galaxy which is surrounded by a big halo of dark matter. That's pretty cool. But the galaxy is a big place too, and we live here on Earth. At this moment, we're here in this room. So how does this big halo affect us? What is the situation like for us? Now let's zoom into this picture, and this is what we see. So we're in this room in Vancouver, in the northern, he northern hemisphere on Earth, and the Earth revolves around the sun. The sun moves around in the galaxy as well, and this halo of dark matter is also moving around. As a result of all this motion, the motion of the Earth around the sun, sun in the galaxy, and the dark matter itself, there are times of the year when in the northern hemisphere, say, your headwind, you're, you're going headfirst into the dark matter, and at other times, you're going against the dark matter. So in a sense, you feel a wind of dark matter. You're moving around this big halo, so you feel a wind of dark matter hitting your face. This is very real. You don't feel it because it interacts very weakly, but it's happening. So in fact, there's probably dark matter passing through this room as we speak, passing through our bodies, passing through this room. So I hope I've told you that dark matter really does matter. It's important, it's out there in space, and it's also here in this room. If it's here in this room, we want to be able to study it. It's very difficult to study dark matter if it's just moving around in space somewhere. We want to study it in a confined setting, in a controlled environment. And we want to ask the same questions of dark matter that we ask of visible matter. We know visible matter is made up of particles. We've spent the last 100, 200 years doing that. So we also want to ask a fundamental question about dark matter, and that is, is dark matter is made, of, is made up of particles? Is dark matter a new elementary particle? If it was a new elementary particle, we can estimate that there would be a couple of dark matter particles in your cup of tea or coffee. So it's very much there, and we want to understand it better. So how do we look for this dark matter? What's the best and easy way to do it? Well, how can you look for dark matter in the lab? Now, the simplest way to do this is to take a bunch of some stuff, to take atoms of a material that you do understand, and wait for the dark matter particles that are passing through to hit your atoms. Every now and then, a dark matter particle passes through. It collides with the atom of the material that you understand. That, that atom recoils, and the dark matter particle passes through. You study the recoil of the atom, and from that, you try to infer the properties of the dark matter itself. It's very easy conceptually. It can be done, and you would imagine that we should have figured it out by now. The only difference is that there's a lot of stuff in the atmosphere which could also collide with your detector. There's a lot of stuff out there. There's protons, there's neutrons, there's light particles. There's a, it's a busy environment, and you want to distinguish those interactions from the dark matter interactions. So you want to keep your dark matter, you, you want to keep your experiment in a place where you can block off all the other particles from hitting it. 
the best place you can do that is deep underground. The Earth itself is one of the best shields for this detector. It blocks off most of the other particles hitting it, and you only see a dark matter particle strike your detector. That's one way to look for dark matter, deep underground. What's the other way to look for dark matter? What's the other place to look for dark matter? Out in space. So I told you that dark matter is dark. It doesn't emit light. You can't really see it. But you can imagine that there are particles of dark matter that collide with each other and emit light after the collision. A telescope like the Fermi telescope looks for bright sources of light in the sky and could possibly detect this light coming from dark matter. The only difficulty there is the fact that everything in space is bright. Everything in, that we see in space emits light. So the challenge is to distinguish light coming to us from dark matter as compared to light coming to us from some other astrophysical object like a star or a pulsar or something else. It's a challenge, but it can be done, and people have been working on this. So out there in space is the second place to look for dark matter. What's the third place to look for dark matter? Well, instead of looking for it everywhere, why don't we just make it ourselves? Let's make dark matter in the lab. So here's a picture of the ATLAS experiment. It's part of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And this is the birthplace of the Higgs boson that you may have heard of. You can see the man there on the slide first to give you an idea of how big the experiment is. So the experiment is done in such a way, you have uh, beams of high energy protons that collide with each other. You produce a whole bunch of particles, and every now and then you see new particles in there. This is the way the Higgs boson was produced, and this is the way we hope to see dark matter as well. The only cha challenge there again is the fact that you're producing lots of new particles, and it's very difficult to distinguish dark matter from the rest of them. It's difficult, but it's not impossible, and scientists are working very hard to see if we can produce dark matter at the same place that we produce the Higgs boson. So in summary, there are three places you can look for dark matter in the lab. You, look, you can look for it deep underground, you, look, you can look for it out there in space, or you can look for it on the border of Switzerland and France, which is where this experiment is. <laughs> so we spent a lot of time in the visible sector, in the visible world, all our lives for generations on end have evolved only in the visible world. It's only in the last 80 years or so that we've been aware of this other world, the dark world, which is more abundant than the visible world and probably just as old. It was there longer than anyone of us in this room. We just didn't know about it. Dark matter is very important. It's important for the formation of galaxies. It's very important for us because we live in a galaxy. But there's very little we do understand about dark matter. The way we know that matter is made of atoms and now matter is made of particles, we want to find out whether dark matter itself is made of, say, dark atoms, dark molecules, dark forces. These are the questions we want to answer, and it is for this reason that we're doing experiments to probe the nature of dark matter. If we don't discover dark matter in the lab, well, that's just the way nature works. There's nothing we can do about it. It'll turn out that dark matter interacts with us only gravitationally. It is responsible for the evolution of galaxies, but it doesn't really make any other difference to our lives. However, if we do discover dark matter in the lab, then who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what's going to happen next? Thank you. <laughs>